Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Um, I think we're going to kick off in a second. Please do continue to enjoy, um, introduce yourself in the chat, um, just so we know who you are and where you've come from. But we've got a packed agenda today, so um, we probably need to get going. So uh, my name is Theo Clay. I'm the policy manager here at NPC. And thanks very much for joining us today for this cost of living event crisis on can charities be the only safety net? Um, the cost of living crisis has already hit home for nearly everyone that the charity sector supports. In May, the Food Foundation found that one in eight adults in the UK had gone without a meal in the previous month because they couldn't for, afford access to food. With bills due to rise even more in the autumn, people all over the country are going to be facing really difficult choices this year. Charities of all types are likely to face increased demand, um, whilst pressures on individuals' budgets might mean that charities have reduced access to volunteers. This is also going to coincide with inflationary pressures on income and uh, reduced donations, which might mean that charity budgets are even more tightly squeezed. Our recent work here at NPC uh, with Kent County Council has looked at the kind of pre-existing issues that charities had with not receiving the full amount it costs to deliver a service. And these issues are only likely to be exacerbated for charities all over the country who might see their income shrink. Charities are already gearing up to shift services and to expand their work to meet needs around the country, but coming so soon after the COVID-19 pandemic, many organisations are justifiably concerned about the resilience of their organisation in the face of all of these combined issues. And crucially, of course, what this is going to mean for the people who they support. But our state of the sector research um, showed that even before the pandemic, charities were already trying to do more with less and by their own accounts were already finding themselves stretched thin. We've increasingly seen charities taking on a bigger role than they would have done in the past in specific areas. Um, and this has come to a head in the pandemic and the current crisis, but actually pre-existed both. Today, we want to try and explore this issue. So we'll be discussing what role charities are playing in this current crisis and how this role has changed over time. Uh, we'll be looking at the causes for it and what charities should be playing in key moments like this, what role we think they should be playing in, in society at times of crisis, and what charities and funders should be doing to try and bring this particular role about and who they should be influencing. We've got three great speakers today to try and discuss this with us. Um, first of all, we're gonna hear from Molly Broom, who's an economist at the Resolution Foundation, who will give us some of the context for these issues and what they mean for uh, the living standards of people around the country. We'll then be hearing from Sumi Rabindra Kumar, who is Head of Policy and Research at the Trussell Trust, who will be speaking about the Trussell Trust's increasing role, both in providing food to those who need during a crisis, but also in trying to kind of achieve systems change to, um, so food banks are no longer required in the UK. Finally, we'll be hearing from our very own Dan Corey, who will be drawing on his own extensive experience in government and the charity se sector to speak a little bit about what we need to see from government and what charities need to be doing to try to bring that about. Um, we've got some time for questions at the end for all the panellists and plenty of time to discuss all these issues. So please um, feel free to use that, uh, that Q&A function, keep getting your questions in uh, as the panellists go through their presentations. But to start off with, um, I'm going to hand over to Molly, um, uh, who is an economist at the Resolution Foundation. Molly joined the Resolution Foundation in uh, February of this year, and her work focuses on intergenerational fairness and wealth inequality. Before joining the Foundation, Molly worked at an economic consultancy where she provided research and analysis and advice on local economic development and innovation policy. And Molly's going to be uh, explaining a bit of the context today to the current crisis and how it's likely to affect the types of people that charities support. So uh, Molly, I'll hand over to you then. Thank you, Theo. Um, so I think I have some slides, but um, yeah, as Theo said, I'm an economist at the Resolution Foundation. We're an independent think tank aimed at improving the li living standards of low to middle income earners. Um, and as Theo said, I'll use the next 10 minutes or so to provide a bit of an overview of the cost of living crisis um, and how it's affecting people um, over the next, or how it will affect people over the next few months. 
Um, so if you want to go on to the next slide. So uh, this chart shows that inflation was rising at the end of last year due to the economy reopening and recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, in November 2021, the Bank of England expected inflation to rise to around 5% in the spring of this year before gradually declining. But as we all know, the global context has changed significantly since then, with the most recent forecasts um, indicating the impact of the war in Ukraine. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has um, caused a spike in global energy prices, which has exacerbated the post-pandemic uh, inflation jump. The Bank of England now expects inflation to reach 10.4% in Q4 of this year, its highest level since the 1980s. And this spike is largely driven by the assumption that the energy price cap will rise to around £2,800 for a typical household on a variable tariff in October. And this chart also shows that the bank expects inflation to be a lot more long lasting than um, for just a few months ago. Uh, next slide. Um, so the previous chart shows that these forecasts have been changing dramatically month on month. So to focus on what is actually happening, last month's data shows that inflation rose to 9% um, in April, its highest rate in 40 years. And we were expecting inflation to soar um, in April due to the 54% increase in the energy price cap taking effect at the start of last month, which increased bills by nearly £700 for a typical family. Uh, next slide. But while rising energy bills are largely driving the latest inflation surge, they are not the only place where prices are rising. Food inflation hit 6.7% last month, with food prices last rising this quickly in 2008. And we expect them to keep rising again as a result of the war in Ukraine. Uh, next slide. Uh, that being said, uh, there is large variation in price increases across food items. The ONS looked at how prices of everyday food items have changed for the lowest cost products in response to questions raised around how this rising inflation is impacting the poorest in society. And as this chart shows, the items that have seen the largest price increases since April last year include items such as pasta, crisps and bread. But at the same time, over the same period, some items have actually seen a fall uh, in price, such as uh, potatoes, cheese and, uh, and chips. Uh, next slide, please. So what does all this inflation mean for the cost of living? Well, for many people, prices are rising um, quicker than earnings, meaning that their money won't go as far as it used to. March's pay data shows that regular pay, so pay excluding bonuses, increased by around 4% um, on the year to January to March. And while this wage growth could be considered healthy, it's nowhere near enough to uh, match rising inflation. And so as a result, real average wages are falling at their fastest rate in almost a decade, with real pay in March falling by almost 2%. Right. Lower income families are more exposed to the cost of living crisis because they spend more of their total budgets on essentials. So it's harder for this group to cut back on discretionary items or substitute to cheaper versions of products. So for example, it's harder for lower income families because they can't just cut back on eating out at expensive restaurants because they're not doing that in the first place. Another reason that the cost of living crisis will be more difficult for lower income families is because poorer households tend to spend more of their income on gas and electricity bills than richer households. And given that a large proportion of this inflationary pressure is being driven by rising energy prices, lower income households will feel much worse off. Next slide, please. Uh, the bottom heaviness of this cost of living crisis can be seen by the proportion of English households predicted to be in fuel stress or severe fuel stress at various points this year. 
As mentioned earlier, the energy price cap could rise to £2,800 for a typical family in October, and this would see 41% of households in England fall into fuel stress, where they spend more than 10% of their incomes on energy bills, and this is a big jump from the 11% of households last winter. Even more pressing is the rise in households in England falling into severe fuel stress, which is where they spend more than a fifth of incomes on energy bills. An average an £2,800 average energy bill would see more than 1.9 million English households fall into severe fuel stress this winter, up hugely from 322,000 last year. And as the chart shows, it is households in the bottom income deciles who are more likely to fall into severe fuel stress. Next slide. But it's also important to remember that um, fuel, levels of fuel stress vary, vary by household type. So with larger households, um, households uh, older households and households with disabled residents more likely to fall into severe fuel stress this winter. Uh, next slide. Um, so what has actually been done to tackle the cost of living crisis? Um, in response to calls to help people with the cost of living crisis, the Chancellor announced a big package of energy bill support on the 26th of May, worth around 15 billion. These measures are progressive with a set of universal payments to all households complemented with large, larger payments for those on means tested benefits and also to pensioners. These new measures do a good job at rebalancing the support to those that need it most. As the chart shows, the support in the February package was fairly equally distributed across the bottom, middle and top household income quintiles. And the support announced in the spring statement was much more generous to middle and higher income households as a result of the various tax cuts announced. However, in the most recent package of support, the Chancellor filled the gap by using the benefit system, with the bottom quintile receiving twice as much support as the top quintile. Next slide. Um, over the combined set of measures announced this year, the Chancellor has in effect offset 82% of the anticipated rise in energy bills, but this rises to 93% for households in the bottom three income deciles. As a result, this winter looks far less grim for many households. Uh, next slide. And finally, some concluding thoughts from me. So government was right to support households with higher energy costs now. And as we've shown, the new measures do a good job at rebalancing support to those who need it most. However, while one-off payments may be the best way to deliver emergency support, they are not an ideal way to operate the UK's benefit system. The major problem with one-off payments is that it introduces sharp cliff edges between those receiving benefits on the cut-off date and those who claim just after, and therefore receive no additional support. Flat rate support does not also reflect the different levels of need within the benefit system as a result of different energy usage. For example, households with three or more children will see an energy bills pushed up by 500 pounds plus a year more than those without children, but they will still receive the same one-off payment. And then finally, as we've shown, um, other sources of, of inflation, such as food inflation, means that it will still be a very difficult year for many low income households. Um, and that was all for me, so I will pass back to Theo. Thanks very much, Molly. That was a really clear and interesting run through the, the economic context of the current crisis that we're looking at. And I think particularly that with that, um, yeah, uh, the, the focus on how it's likely to affect um, lower income households more than more than other households. I think lots of people in charities were really relieved to see the support package that came through in May. But um, I, it's interesting to hear as well this that clearly hasn't solved all the issues and there's going to be um, a, a big role for charities still in the coming months. Uh, to speak more about that in particular, um, I'm going to hand over to our next speaker, uh, Sumi Ravindra Kumar. Um, Sumi is the head of policy at re and research at the food bank charity, The Trussell Trust. So she previously worked in policy and research roles for Gingerbread, which is a charity working with single parent families and the children's charity Quorum. Uh, 
The Trussell Trust, for those of you who aren't aware, is a network of over 1,300 food bank centres across the UK, which is working to end the need for food banks by ensuring that everyone can afford the essentials. Um, so, Sumi, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Um, I think I also have a handful of slides to um, share, and I think that's just popping up now. Um, so thanks a lot for inviting us to contribute to today. Um, I thought I'd start a bit uh, with a bit about the Trussell Trust itself. Um, we just had a bit of an intro there, but we started back in 1997 with one um, centre distributing food. And now, as was just said, we're more than 1,300 local food bank centres um, operating out of about four, over 400 um, food bank organisations. And we work right across the UK, um, providing practical support for people who don't have enough money for the things we all need. Um, and as is well known, that covers emergency support, uh, emergency food, but also other items like toiletries. Um, and the network uh, increasingly also provides wider services um, such as signposting and referrals um, and even co-located services um, with uh, charities like advice agencies to help start address some of those underlying issues um, that drive people to food banks. Um, and it's that sort of latter point that, if we move on to the next slide, um, has been the kind of uh, sort of context for us as an organisation, particularly as we moved into the pandemic and now the cost of living crisis, um, where we sort of took a step back and reflected on what that growth really meant and what that sort of those shifts in services um, really meant in terms of us as a charity and as an organisation and what our role is within local communities. Um, and we set out a new five-year strategy back in 2020 and recognizing that while we're needed um, and we'll be helping people day, we'll be helping people day in, day out. Um, and while we recognize that charitable food provision doesn't didn't start with the Trussell Trust and certainly won't end with the Trussell Trust, there are lots of sort of ad hoc support like soup kitchens um, and lots of low cost. Um, alternatives to food provision in our communities like pantries um, and other types of providers. The fact remains that the growth that we've seen um, over the last sort of 25 years represents a real growth in the kind of systemic provision of emergency food aid that shouldn't need to exist in the UK. Um, and so in our new strategy, we laid out this vision that we should all be free from hunger and um, our sort of key aim, as, if, as has been said, is a future where no one needs a food bank um, to get by. And what we mean by that is that we don't want to be part um, of any further entrenchment or embedding of the systematic provision and the kind of infrastructure behind emergency food aid as we see in our country today or across the UK today. So the kind of overriding question for us across our research and our advocacy um, and in our sort of practical local programs and initiatives is really trying to find solutions, which mean we can remove ourselves from the picture um, and asking that question about sort of how do we, yeah, how do we step back from that type of provision and ensure that people no longer need a food bank to make ends meet. Um, so with that in mind, that strategy, if we move on to the next slide, uh, has been an interesting context for the last couple of years um, from the pandemic and then straight into the cost of living crisis, holding true to that vision um, of trying to step back and to end the need for food banks has been um, quite challenging, given the burden that's been placed on our services and systems and staff and volunteers. Um, it's been pretty well documented in uh, the kind of escalation of needs seen during the pandemic, um, particularly at the outset um, of the pandemic. But um, I thought I'd just quickly capture the kind of state of play at the moment, both in terms of our latest stats and the cost of living crisis. So the last financial year, we provided more than 2.1 million um, emergency food parcels across the UK. And that was the first time that we provided over 2 million um, outside of the pandemic. So it was kind of a, yeah, a record high, a depressing record high. Um, and that's really part of a long-term shift um, in the increasing need for food banks in the UK. Um, so as it says on the slide, um, if you look at five years ago, um, needs escalated by about 
um, when we look at food parcel provision. And those stats are just the tip of the iceberg. The Trussell Trust is just one um, network of providers, but there's lots of other independent um, food banks that um, are also part of the picture and are seeing very, very similar trends. And then when it comes to the cost of living crisis, um, our evidence really shows um, a lot of what's been talking about, about that sort of those warning, early warning signs about just how um, serious the crisis was, even at a very early stage. So when we looked at our last financial year's worth of data, we saw a real acceleration of need in the last half of that year. So from the autumn into the winter, um, and in the last six months of that year, I think it was 1.2 million parcels were provided, which is more than the entire year for um, 2016, 2017. And when we looked at those last two quarters, we could see that um, the increase in need outstripped um, previous um, years worth of data. So it was definitely above, you know, well above what was to be expected. And the December just gone, um, was actually our busiest on record outside of the pandemic. We also did some polling alongside that, um, a commission from YouGov um, of universal credit claimants, and that showed even at the start of the year, people were already facing in what we would term impossible decisions. So it wasn't, it wasn't about choices of what to cut back on, but about people going without core essentials. So some of the data, for example, was about one in three people, which is about two million um, universal credit claimants, uh, we're going without sufficient food, we're going without sufficient heating, one in five were being pulled into debt, um, and around two in five, or nearly two in five, were cutting, going without essentials um, across the board, so two or more of the essentials, like food, shelter, basic toiletries. So we could see that that cost of living crisis wasn't just about energy costs or food costs, but about living costs um, in general. And so what we were raising concerns about and still raising concerns about is this picture of severe and deepening hardship already emerging um, ahead of the kind of you know forecasts of it, it, even more um, difficult times ahead with increasing costs and the energy price cap going up. Um, and if we move on to the next slide. Um, I think when we were reflecting on kind of what this means for people on the lowest incomes, I think in taking a step back from the experience of the Trussell Trust and lots of other frontline organisations, really we're, we're quite clear that this isn't really a crisis that has come out of nowhere for people on the lowest incomes. Um, and similarly, it's not a crisis that will very easily end um, even when inflation falls back again. Um, and so it's very much a kind of crisis that's been a long time in the making. And that's um, backed up by the fact that we've got sort of a consistent body of evidence now, which shows that hunger in the UK isn't about food, but about incomes or a lack of income. Um, and it's overwhelmingly extremely low incomes that drive need for food banks. Um, and so our research shows that people are having to manage on um, less than £60 a week after housing costs. So it's about 13% of average national income. 95% uh, of people referred to our network would be classed as um, living in destitution, so um, would meet the threshold of not being able to afford a, a basic basket of about six goods, um, like food, shelter and toiletries. Um, and so the modelling that we commissioned from academics uh, on, sort of on, on the drivers of needs and um, potential variables that might contribute to need locally, concluded that were food banks not in place in those areas, that need would go, that need would go unmet. So um, when, we, when we took a step back and, and we look at what's driving that, those unmet needs, there are some clear um, themes that come out, which really show that, um, show how they're kind of conscious decisions and conscious uh, levers that have been pulled that have resulted us being in the situation we are now with both the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. So one of those is around social security, which comes out as the kind of most immediate driver of need for food banks in the UK. Um, and that's particularly uh, due to what we would call design choices um, rather than sort of administrative errors or those sorts of things. And that's in the form of things like benefit rates, um, the rules and design of the system, like the five-week wait for a first payment for universal credit, um, 
choices like the two child limit or the benefit cap or contributing to incomes really being paired to the bone for people um, for groups who are most at risk of needing a food bank and also secondly um, around local support so that's a kind of a less immediate driver but an underlying um, sort of background factor in need for food banks um, in our communities um, and again that uh, a lot of that reflects um, changes in local crisis support that um, is available to stop sort of short-term crises like a fridge breaking down or something like that turning into longer-term hardship and putting people into longer-term debt um, when support for um, crisis payments like that was localized in England in particular what we've ended up with is a sort of patchwork of different pots of money um, and the classic kind of postcode lottery um, of support, which means that there isn't that consistent um, fallback position when people need very quick access to financial support to just to bridge kind of gaps in, in um, incomes due to unexpected shocks. We, we also do see a sort of other underlying um, strands uh, around sort of life challenges, particularly um, ill health and disability, but also life shocks like eviction, domestic abuse, um, and job loss and so those are sort of underlying um, challenges which contribute to that sort of complexity of the picture but what we're but what we kind of really finding is that the fallout from the pandemic and our current cost of living crisis really reflects um, the long-term shifts in depleting support through social security and through local support for people on the lowest incomes. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, there's a quote there that you can read from one of our area managers. Um, and really the upshot from this and looking at some of the trends is that when we look at the role that food banks have been playing and they've been playing particularly over the last sort of year or two, um, there, there is a lot uh, which is about picking up the pieces of both government action and inaction. So a mix of deliberate policy choices and then a failure to recognise the consequences of those choices um, means that communities have increasingly relied upon frontline organisations like food banks to get by. Um, and when you look particularly at the emergency food side of support in our network, um, really what's ended up, what that's ended up being is kind of a sticking plaster for those um, key drivers of need. And as this quote shows, sort of at its worst, there's, an, there's often a limit to how much organizations like food banks can do um, and so our inflection is really at some point the buck has to stop elsewhere if we're really to see a future where um, no one needs a food bank to get by and then finally just a few reflections on that question about sort of what our role should be um, and the extent to which we can see that vision that we hope for um, at first and foremost um, the kind of picture that's coming out increasingly loudly is that food bank staff and volunteers are sort of at their limits, um, even before the cost of living crisis hit over a third so that we surveyed um, said that they were exhausted. Um, secondly, the pandemic, uh, pandemic and the current cost of living crisis has really brought sharply into focus the fact that people on the lowest incomes are really out of options when they are faced with no choice um, but a food bank. Um, it's really a reflection that they've already made all the cutbacks that there are to make. Um, there isn't anything more that sort of budgeting or choices like that can really do. Um, and sort of alongside that, what is sort of important to draw lessons from is that some of the responses from government have been quite um, positive and also responses from the public that this is no longer a tenable position, that this isn't, um, right um, is a sort of hopefully a starting point for change if we can recognize in the cost of living crisis people being people facing these kinds of impossible decisions um, isn't a sustainable one for our communities then we should think that that isn't sustainable in the long term as well so even when we're out of a period of national crisis the fact that day in day out there are people in our communities who are still facing those sorts of financial crises still having to turn to a food bank we should be willing to step up and create the change that's needed where that um, can be changed in the long term. Um, thirdly, I think one of the other things to draw from as 
Molly was talking about, there are some um, positives in terms of the government testing some of the tools that can create change. So there's a real potential to make a difference um, when you look at the difference that the Universal Credit Uplift made. Um, hopefully what some of the investments through the benefit system um, has been recently announced will make. Some of the choices during the pandemic, for example, like the suspension of deductions from benefits um, and also good practice uh, seen in some local areas in the th when uh, the Chancellor announced further investment in local crisis support. Um, they're all things that uh, have been temporary and one off, but they are also equally a sort of starting point to build from for longer term change. And that's the thing that the Trussell Trust really wants to focus on, that let's learn from those lessons and turn them from one off changes to sustain changes so that people don't need a free bank to get by. And then finally, just from a, the perspective of a charity, um, a reflection that we, in terms of the Trussell Trust, as, as well as our network of food banks, can play um, an active role in creating that change as well. Um, so obviously, sort of with, within our team, we do lots. Of, we um, build our evidence base and um, focus on a lot of advocacy around the government levers that make a difference. But we're also, as a charity, investing in um, models to test what can um, alleviate some of those underlying drivers. So we've got a partnership with Citizens Advice called the Help Through Hardship um, Helpline, uh, focusing really on financial inclusion and maximising incomes um, to see what can be done outside of a food bank environment. And also in, locally in our communities, um, lots of food banks are testing services and ways to create change. So financial, service, uh, financial inclusion services, for example, or looking at referral pathways. So food banks are the last port of call rather than the first um, point of call um, and, and recognizing that sort of food banks are local leaders in their own right and have the expertise and networks to make a real difference um, locally to create that change. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of a more positive conclusion in terms of a look ahead of what we can draw from this crisis, but very much agree with the point that, um, that there are still tough times ahead and our real concern is that the support has been one off and um, needs to be sustained if we're to see a sort of longer term shift. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Sumi. A really kind of stark um, reminder of the, the, the real issues that people are facing at the moment, but also, I suppose, the, the, the political drivers um, and the choices which, uh, which can be made to try and tackle those. I think it's really interesting to trace the Trussell Trusts shift i mean the trust trust was started in my hometown of salisbury and when i used to give food bank or uh, food parcels um uh, when i was at primary school they were being sent abroad to bulgaria um but over time because of the rising needs here the trust trust has had to shift to deliver delivery in uk and i think that's quite representative of the wider systemic issues we've been facing and the the Trust of Trust mission to try and end the need for food banks rather than simply tackling those symptoms, I think, is one that a lot of other charities can draw on. So to speak more, uh, our final speaker on to speak a bit more about some of those political drivers is uh, Dan Corey. So Dan is the chief executive here at NPC. He's got an extensive career in public policy and economics. He was the head of the number 10 policy unit under Gordon Brown and then a senior advisor to the prime minister on the economy from 2007 to 2010 and over oversaw the response to a very different economic crisis then. Prior to that, Dan was the chair of the Council for, of Economic Advisors to the Treasury, and he's also worked in departments as wide ranging as, the, as education, trade and industry, transport and local government. Uh, amongst other positions at the moment, Dan's also a trustee of St Mungo's and uh, the What Works Centre for Wellbeing. So Dan, I'm going to hand over to you now uh, for the uh, final remarks before we go to questions. Thanks a lot, Theo, and I and I hope what I'm going to say um, uh, sort of is a, a nice um, addition to what Molly and Sumi have said, and particularly Sumi was starting to talk about the role of government, and I'm going to try and talk from that kind of perspective. And, and I think the first thing to say, which I, I guess we all know, is that the role of government and civil society and where the boundary up is and where they interact is always a confusing thing in our society, and it's always unclear. And I think that gets even more confused in a crisis like the cost of living. From the charity side and the philanthropy side, donors have always had 
issues um you know what should what should be funded by the by the sector uh, are people replacing what should be government funded and delivered services how much strain for instance in areas like mental health or homelessness should charities take rather than the government and then the government is, is not sure what charities are really who they're accountable to it's why one of the reasons they're often more comfortable in dealing with charities in terms of services via contracts rather than grants and so on so we have we, we're always going to have a bit of that that issue about where the boundaries are and they change over time and it's a fuzzy line it's not a a straight line but one thing that's clear to me uh, and I like to think it was clear to me when I was in government which is that government cannot solve a lot of things particularly a crisis like this without the voluntary sector it has the information about what's going on at the ground it has a reach it has uh, trust from communities that don't trust the state uh, and of course it has some capacity wonderful volunteers people working in the charities so it sort of reaches into every nook and cranny of our society in one way or another and that's going to be necessary if we're really to do our best to come through the cost of living crisis uh, in, in the best way we can. I think the problem is it's not clear that government and Whitehall really understands this. And if you look, for instance, politically, conservative MPs, for instance, tend to be rather wary of the sector beyond local kind of worthy activity in their, in their own constituency. And a recent survey, survey by Program Economics suggested this, although the, the, the sort of response rate wasn't very high, but, it, but also we know that some of these, these people are slightly all over the place on, on food banks, for instance, on the one hand, sort of um, uh, being quite pleased to go and cut the ribbon on a new food bank and on the other hand saying it's the food banks that have kind of caused the demand for food banks, as it were, if they didn't exist, then people wouldn't use them. Um, so you get a lot of um, suspicion on the political side, but also, as I know from my time in the treasury and in other departments, a lot of civil servants know very little about the sector. And they have a suspicion that the sector is, quite frankly, a bit useless. It's a bit moaning, it's a bit amateurish, it doesn't use resources efficiently and so forth. I think that's a problem. I think it's probably a good thing at the minute, particularly on the cost of living crisis, that some of their own, some of their former, very senior civil servants are now in the sector and shouting loudly about the cost of living crisis. And I'm thinking of people like Claire Moriarty, who's now running Citizens of Vice, and she was a permanent secretary before she came into the sector, and Paul Kissack, who's running Joseph Rantry Foundation, he was a very senior civil servant. So I think those things will help. But to be fair to government, we have to be honest as well that not all of the voluntary sector is equally good or is delivering as it should. And it's not always value for money to use a sort of treasury term. And that does make it hard if you put yourself in the, in the, in the shoes of the, uh, let's say treasury officials uh, or local government officials to understand exactly um, who, who they should support, who they should listen to, rather than just who shouts the loudest and has the best sort of campaigning operation. Again, to be fair, the sector also hits this cost of living crisis, having had some difficult years. It's had, it had about a decade of austerity, which started to be turned off, but there was a lot of uh, wounds left from that. And then, of course, we've had COVID, which has not only been difficult for a lot of charities, but a lot of independent funders, grant makers, uh, sort of dipped into their reserves as much as they could to help the sector. So they're not feeling as flush as perhaps we'd like them to going into this uh, sector, to this crisis. I'm reflecting in, in my time in, in Downing Street when we had a big crisis. Our big crisis um, was the financial crisis of 2008 to 10, which did have big impacts on unemployment uh, and therefore on issues of poverty and so forth. One of the things we did was set up new machine, machinery, in that case it was the National Economic Council, to try to get government to really focus on the crisis at hand and stop departments just going off and carrying on doing their own thing that they've been doing uh, before, get them to really focus. Clearly during that period, the very big calls were fiscal calls, you know, how much will we spend, how much will we be tax and so forth. But all departments at the time who attended that, that um, Economic Council were asked to come up with ideas that could help to, uh, to deal with the, the consequences uh, and the symptoms. Um, and I think you can see some similarities of that going on at the moment. We, we read in, in the press all sorts of uh, things about various uh, cabinet committees um, meeting and the prime minister sort of demanding uh, ideas for them uh, as to what they can do for the cost of living. I have to say though, at the minute, it's all been a bit underwhelming. The things that come to my mind are things like having an MOT every two years instead of every year, probably a useful thing to do, but not transformational. So departments are thinking, and I think that shows really one of the things it shows, which I think is important for us all to understand in the, in the charity sector is that 
Politicians will be desperate to be seen to do things for the cost of living crisis and to actually do things that people will actually feel the benefit of. Politicians will know that jam tomorrow, and I'm afraid I characterise that as the levelling up agenda, worthy though it is, is not cutting it with the public. And it probably won't, at least for the next year, while the cost of living and high inflation are around are the main talking points. Nor, um, Molly mentioned the, the big announcement by uh, Rishi Sunak uh, in May. It was a very big splurge, a lot of money, uh, but it hasn't shifted views much. People are still not really convinced that the government's on their side. So they will be in the market for ideas and ways to ease the pain. And charities should be making their ideas clear, especially if well evidenced. And I have to say that evidence and lack of it is what often thrown back by civil servants, uh, politicians in defensive mode as to why they don't do what the charity sector wants. That yes, that we need the stories, we need to get the people with lived experience in front of all these people, but we also need to have some hard data. Remember as well that MPs, of course, we, we've been talking mainly and rightly about how the cost of living crisis is going to hit people down at the bottom of the income distribution. But remember, the MPs will not only care about those at the bottom, where charities tend to work the most, but for the median Middle England voter and their family. And so I think that's something to bear in mind as, as people are coming up with their proposals. And although, although Whitehall, let alone Westminster, will be convulsed by the leadership votes of confidence going on at the minute, politicians do know that the, the way they deal with the cost of living crisis is going to be the real big determinant of, uh, of politics over the next year and probably running up to the next election. Just one other thing about government here. Of course, government should work with the voluntary sector to understand what it can do and to help it and to enable it. But of course, it must also do things to reduce the demand for the services that the voluntary sector delivers. delivers. And Sumi said some of this. It's only government at the end of the day that can increase benefit levels or bring in wider definitions of who gets free school meals. There is no substitute that the voluntary sector can offer and we, can, we shouldn't pretend and nor should government uh, kid itself that there's some solution that our sector uh, can deliver. Uh, they have some rather bigger tools than we do. And of course, that's why so many people advocate for some of these changes. Most of what I've just said then is all about central government. I think on the whole, it's more likely to be better working with the, with the charitable sector uh, at local and sort of mayoral levels. Um, certainly our work at MPC, looking at three uh, places during COVID shows that this can work well, and it works better if the relations were all quite good before, and that the vo voluntary sector locally has the capacity uh, to, uh, to work with the council or with, with health and so forth, and works well together too. Sometimes the problem is a lack of uh, desire from the public sector to work together with the voluntary sector. To be honest, sometimes it's the other way around, but both need to do it. And we saw a lot of that in COVID, and I hope that will happen and come, come again during the cost of living crisis. Just a final point I want to make, because it's part of the role of the voluntary sector. At times, the government always finds the voluntary sector difficult. It's a critical sector, it's impatient, it's not united, it doesn't have a single voice. Some people describe it as a baggy monster. And it will be doing a lot of advocacy during the cost of living crisis as it sees the people it is trying to help suffering badly. And my plea to government is to resist the temptation, uh, which is very real, to try and stop its voice just because it may be critical. Listen to it, it has a lot of powerful ideas and insights that can help us all weather this cost of living crisis as best we can. So I hope uh, ministers will take that on board and not do the natural, natural thing, which arguably some of the legislation going through uh, at the moment is about, which is to keep the sector quiet. So I hope that gives some insights into how government might be thinking about this cost of living crisis and therefore how charities can play into those sort of agendas. Thanks very much, Dan. Really, really helpful perspective from from government. Um, I think that it's easy to kind of, uh, uh, you know, try and push for everything that we want and and um, think about what we would want in an ideal world to see from the government. But it's also helpful to think about how these issues are seen at a time of crisis and exactly how, um, you know, departments like the ones you worked in um, think about working with the voluntary sector and what that means for charities. So thanks very much for that. So we're going to move on to questions now, um, and so please do keep them coming in via our Q&A function. Um, but we've already got a couple that have uh, come in, so I'm going to pick out um, a couple and start putting them to our panellists. So to begin with, I mean, we just discussed the kind of role of government within this crisis. Um, and so I suppose the first thing to touch on, which would be helpful, 
um, to discuss would be what support ideally would we want to see uh, to try and help charities meet rising energy costs and, and other uh, issues that they're facing? What can the government do to help? Um, without support, we're hearing that the viability of some charities might be in question and so they might not be here as a safety net. Um, and I suppose particularly might be helpful to think of this with what Dan was saying in mind around what do we know, what do we have the evidence for that will actually work and, and support people. So Sumi, I might come to you first and then come to Molly if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I think the Trussell Trust is in a slightly different position from some charities on the front line. Um, in that in terms of sort of government support, we don't seek direct government funding from central government um, because we are trying to avoid that entrenchment of, of food bank provision as a response, um, a policy response. Um, that being said, uh, there are lots of things that would help in terms of easing that burden. So investment in the wider support services that would alleviate the burden on food banks. So things like advice services, local other local support services and networks that provide that kind of um, that uh, crisis support and crisis management, which would allow people to um address some of those or navigate some of those systems like the benefit system or dealing with energy suppliers and that, that sort of advice that would go a long way and then first and foremost what we really want to see is the kind of um, cash first approach particularly in the crisis that we're seeing at the moment again would go a long way to alleviate some of the strains that the food bank network is seeing um, because it's that kind of immediate direct support that would um, help people much more quickly and efficiently um, than having to uh, navigate their way to a food bank, for example. Thanks, Sumi. Molly, is there anything you'd add to that? Yeah, no, I think I'd just reiterate what uh, Sumi said. I think easing the burden on charities will be really important, and whether that's through the benefit system by ensuring that. Um, the benefit system provides a sufficient amount of income to people um, so they're not dependent on uh, charities and food banks um, will be really important. Thanks and just to come to Dan last. Yeah I think I mean one of the things that, that you mentioned was about the actual costs of charities going up you know they've got higher energy costs um, obviously labour market's tight and sort of going wages are going up um, you know, I, as, as you mentioned, I'm on the on the board of St Mungo's and uh, some of our frontline people, you know, um, you know, will get tempted when the uh, supermarkets put up their pay, which is a great thing that supermarkets are putting up their pay, but you lose staff and that would be true in quite a lot of areas. So I think there's a real problem for that. I think it may be that government can do something to help there. I think independent funders who fund charities, you should recognise it to the extent they can, the fact that... Uh, you know, a, a ten thousand pound grant um, given a year ago isn't going to go as far uh, as you thought it was because inflation's gone up. Can you do something about that? So I think that kind of uh, all sort of matters. And and lastly, I mean, certainly we've been hearing, um, you know, that there's an issue about volunteers. I think in COVID, uh, volunteers were fantastic. They emerged from everywhere, and that was very helpful. This time, of course, you know, if people are worried about their own, um, the cost of living and their, their own budgets being hit, there's an issue about whether they will volunteer or try and get a bit of extra work. We've also heard of volunteers who are used to, I don't know, drive around and visit lonely people or whatever, uh, saying the petrol price is just too much now, they just can't afford to do it. So th there are some pretty serious issues. And if I was government, and I guess it would be mainly DCMS thinking about this, because they're the sort of department that's mainly about the charity sector, but each department will have relationships with the charities in its own area they should really be looking hard at this and see if there's uh, anything they can do otherwise they'll find the capacity that they assume is just there because the charity sector just kind of delivers it uh, isn't there because we just can't afford it yeah thanks very much dan um i want to come back to something sumi that you were touching on around the kind of the the danger of um you know normalizing a world where food banks exist and and uh, one of our questioners um has touched on an issue which i think applies to a lot of charities which is around um how how do we try and make sure that we we aren't in danger of kind of uh you know establishing where we are now as the base 
line of provision that charities are going to step up and provide this kind of support that we're going to kind of normalize these levels of low benefits and hunger and poverty um and are char do charities and are they currently um helping to drive that kind of normalization by mitigating uh poor political choices so i mean sumi it'd be great to just hear how the trust trust thinks about those kinds of issues it's definitely it's definitely a tricky one to navigate and it's a difficult line because obviously food banks um, and at the Trust of Trust will want to do all they can to help people in their communities, particularly when you see when you are faced with people in very dire circumstances. Um, there is a natural inclination to help and there's a reason why food banks sprang out organically from grassroots um, in our communities because of that sense of injustice and wanting to reach out to support people. Um, and there are and there are positive things within food banks that, that perhaps can't be necessarily gained from, you know, the benefit system and so on. So there's often emotional support and that sort of social support and social contact that might be things, strands of support that you would want to hold on to in our communities. That being said, um, everything that we're geared towards um, in terms of the sort of initiatives that local food banks are considering starting, um, the advocacy that we do, the extent to which we sort of um, take on that role of speaking truth to power and, and providing that evidence. And as Dan was saying, kind of collecting that robust data that can make the case for change. Um, those are all the kind of, that's all the sort of direction of travel for the Trussell Trust and for the network in terms of um, really that laser light focus on wanting a future where we see an end for the need for food banks and making sure that that's a kind of golden thread throughout our, our activity from the grassroots upwards. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I would also uh, pose that question to you, Dan. I don't know if there was ever a feeling when that you heard when, when you were in government around, you know, um, that it's actually okay, the charities will cover it. We don't necessarily need to do a certain thing. Was there any, any ever any kind of awareness of creeping into that kind of space? Yeah, I, th I mean, interesting. Obviously, I, I was working for a Labour government and they, um, you know, tend to be a, a slightly more, more worried about that charity doesn't that charity is fine but charity is not a replacement for for the state sort of thing and sometimes that can end up being a bit too statist quite frankly um whereas you know caricature on the on the conservative side it would probably be the other way around but i, I think there are some areas i think sometimes there are there are genuine areas and, and food banks isn't really one of them but there are some areas where the charity sector will do things better because it's about relationships and particularly where people particularly vulnerable people who had a difficult life uh, maybe addiction issues or being in prison or whatever or, or, or excluded from school have become very distrustful of authority of any type and the key thing that to help them to put their lives back together again is to create some trusting relationships and to treat them with respect and so forth and the state is never very good at that because that person, that social worker you're meeting, the probation officer, they have power over you, they can do all sorts of things to you uh, and you never create that relationship. So some areas, I think governments should leave to the charitable sector and fund them to do it, maybe, and the issues about getting the contracts right and so forth. Um, but areas that are as basic as, you know, people are having to use food banks because they haven't got enough money to buy food for their family is a bit crazy. I mean, just one last thing, Theo. I, I, I do hope that we're, we've got a slightly change in the, in the tone in the debate at the moment. We used to have very strong in the sort of, I don't know, 2012s, 2015s or whatever, very strong, undeserving, poor, deserving, poor kind of thing. And we're hearing a bit less of that at the minute. Uh, and that's that's encouraging because I think that, that that kind of narrative did say that some people don't deserve help from the state. And therefore, in a sense, charities then had to decide whether to support them or not. Uh, I think that I like to think that's going away um, a bit, at least. And so we'll have a more sensible debate about what the state should and shouldn't be doing. Yeah, thanks, Dan. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I suppose next, moving on to kind of, yeah, what the role is of the charity sector in trying to bring about, we talked about what we want to see from government, but maybe it'd be helpful to talk about what charities need to do to try and bring that about. Um, I think one of the barriers that people see here and uh, came up a, a previous MPC event about relationships between charities and government is about the kind of the perspective of government on charities and uh, how charities can try and shift that. So th there's a que this question has come in from someone 
who has noticed that um, job centres um, refuse to be referral partners with food banks, but will through the back door send people uh, to them. So I suppose starting off with Sumi, it'd be helpful to uh, uh, hear how you think about your kind of relationship with government and um, making sure that you're seen as kind of effective partners when you need to be. Yeah, I think that that's um, that sort of dual role of of wanting government to engage with you know your frontline organisations and the reality of what you um, see on the ground, as well as challenging them to act. I think it's a it's a difficult one. Um, I think for us again that comes back down to a mix of the hard data that we're collecting. So we've done a lot a lot to invest in our Sort of independent, very robust um, evidence base. So not just talking about food parcels, but looking a lot more closely at some of the underlying drivers, which obviously government are in, uh, a bit more interested in um, than just purely it's you know it's just about universal credit or it's just about X, Y, and Z. So trying to bring out some of that nuance, um, and also the voice of lived experience. So we, for example, just finished a research project looking at um, deductions from benefits and that was a co-produced piece of work um, where we worked intensively with people with lived experience of debt um, actually to government so things like advance payments which are repaid to the DWP um, and looking at what sort of a fair and safe approach to collecting debt would look like and the kind of and that lived experience was quite powerful um, and we saw a reasonable amount of engagement from civil servants which was quite positive um, with like a sort of doing a bit of a deep dive into, into what we're seeing so I think that dual um, approach of kind of yeah some of the raw evidence or some sort of robust evidence and some of the lived experience evidence um, is helping to do this. I think there's also something about the as has been sort of already said by Dan, that shift in kind of the public debate and public public um, attitudes around empathy um, and sympathy for uh, people who are facing some of these impossible choices um, and a desire for change. I think those two things in tandem um, is helping to shift the debate a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Sumi. So important to tell that full story and use all the, um, the, 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 the data and evidence you have at your disposal, isn't it? Uh, um, Dan or Molly, or keen to hear about how you also think about uh, engaging with government in a way that, um, yeah, make sure you're seen as effective partners. I mean, I mean, just a couple of thoughts, uh, Theo. Um, I mean, one is that certainly when I worked in government, it was clear to me that the voluntary sector often understood what was going on on the ground very much more quickly than we did. You know, even the, the information flows, I, I like to think they're quicker now because everything's digitalized, but nevertheless, um, they would pick up that something bad was happening. I don't know, like, like in a particular area, no one was getting that sort of council tax benefit or whatever. Uh, and then that, so that was very important, that kind of information. And you'd hope that government or, or local government, or whatever would, would act on that. But I do think in general, you know, and I, I said a bit earlier that there's more prospect for, uh, for certain charities working together and with, let's say, the local council or whatever, locally. Um, I mean, you, you gave the example, that, or, or somebody in the, in the chat gave the example of JC+. Plus. And, you know, in a way, government finds it difficult to make some sort of announcement that, you, know, you can see why politically it's quite hard to say we're now going to uh, refer people to, to, um, to food banks or something through JC+. Plus. It's kind of an acceptance of something they don't want to accept is, is happening locally, people will probably just get on with it. And if everybody's talking to each other, I think that will help. Just, just the last thing, I, I don't know, Molly might have a view on this, but I mean, one of the interesting things in the economy at the minute is this massive shortage of labor. And um, we have a lot of people who are inactive, um, which is kind of interesting because I think, I think a lot of people, first of all, understand that poverty now and people with low incomes are not necessarily unemployed. But there's a lot of uh, in-work poverty. But equally, at the moment, there's, there's, it's, a, it's a nightmare for the government. How on earth do they get all these inactive people back into the labour market? And that would reduce uh, upward pressure on wages and everything. The, and we've argued at MPC that the voluntary sector is exactly the people who are very good at working with people who are distanced from the labour market for whatever reason, getting them the confidence to come back, helping them back, 
uh, and all the rest of it. And if I was if I was government, I would be, you know, knocking on the door of the uh, voluntary sector and saying, help us get some of these people back into the labour market. Thanks, Dan. Molly, I don't know if you want to come in on that last point about the labour market or generally how you, the Resolution Foundation think about engaging with government. You are a charity after all. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I would agree with what Dan said. I think it's uh, really important to highlight the issue around uh, the huge amount of uh, inactive workers that we have at the minute. Um, in terms of dealing with the cost of living crisis, I think people have said, oh, why don't you just work more hours? And well, un we've got a well a really low uh, unemployment rate um, at 3.1%. But as Dan said, rightly, there are a, a large amount of people who are inactive, mostly older workers who have left the labour market after um, the pandemic. And yeah, bringing those workers back, I think will be really important um, to ease some of these pressures. Also in terms of, I guess, um, the as you said in work poverty we've done some lived experience work ourselves ourselves um which was published uh, a couple of weeks ago and th these gave us really interesting insights in terms of the people that we spoke to across different focus groups were all um well all really wanted pay increases but just weren't uh well didn't feel very optimistic that they would get those pay increases and i've seen someone in the chat say say that I think we do need higher wages. It's not just about people on the benefit system um, finding the cost of living crisis hard. It's a lot, well, people across all income, um, across the entire income distribution. And I think, you know, increasing the minimum wage and the um, encouraging more businesses to pay the living wage um, is one of the routes to help people through this crisis. Thanks, Molly. That, yeah, really important point. Um, I, I think so. We've chatted a bit about what we'd like to see from from government. Um, we've chatted about how charities can think about engaging with them. Um, but how can kind of what is the role of the charity sector collectively in trying to push for the changes? So this the person who's asking this question points out huge increases in child poverty, um, particularly issues with lone parents. Um, how can the charity sector collectively think about pushing for changes that we want to see, whether that's uh, limits uh, around the two child limits on universal credit, housing provision, childcare costs and the kind of interrelated issues that all come together. Does it look like, is it, is it a coalition? Is it a, some kind of um, yeah other petition that we should be bringing together? Is it behind the scenes? Is it in the open? Um, yeah, keen to get the panellists thought on this. Um, Sumi, if you wouldn't mind me coming to you first. Yeah, of course. It's um... I think the boring answer is probably it's a mix of a mix of a number of things, a mix of all those things. Um, certainly, you know, behind the scenes conversations and, and having that dialogue with government is helpful from civil servants to politicians themselves um, and being able to present that kind of um, balanced uh, view of what the evidence and what the frontline picture is showing. Um, but we were also part of, for example, the Keep the Lifeline Coalition when the Universal Credit Uplift was coming to an end. And that was quite a powerful piece of work, kind of consistent, um, rigorous messaging right across the sector um, that reached out to policymakers as well. Um, and, and that really kind of gathered ahead of steam. Um, obviously, the uplift came to an end, but we saw investment in the taper rate, which um, was surprising at the time. Um, and similarly, the kind of um, consistent messaging around the need for the government to look at uh, benefit rates, keeping pace with at least inflation to prevent further backsliding. We saw effectively um, that commitment in the latest statement from the Chancellor. So that consistent drumbeat of messaging um, across the sector, I think, has been quite a successful one. Um, and then the other, the other um, part of the puzzle for us is definitely that mix of grassroots and lived experience voice. I think is um, the most powerful for us. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't be anywhere without the Food Bank Network. And we're very much our concern, first and foremost, is people who are experiencing these situations and bearing the brunt of the crisis and hearing their voices is really the, the powerful thing for us. Um, and is important because, um, you know, it's, it's important that they're able to express 
uh, what they're experiencing on their own terms, in their own words, but it's also much more um, powerful and convincing and persuasive um, than necessarily people like me uh, talking about it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's a mix of all of those things um, that really creates a change. Yeah, I think that's I think I'm, I think that's absolutely right, Sumi. I, it's interesting to bring up keep the lifeline as well because I suppose there are a whole host of different examples that we can draw on, different methods that we can we can look at in the past. Keep um uh every the everyone in movement around homelessness at the start of the pandemic is one that I know is talked about a lot recently. Uh, Dan or Molly, I don't know if there's any other kind of examples you think we should be learning from or um, methods we should be employing. No, I, th I think I think what Sumi said was was very helpful. I mean, I mean, just just to raise a few points. I mean, one. From, from government, particularly if you sit in the treasury, the charity sector looks like it's always asking for more money, basically. So it will always want more benefits and so forth, and it won't really usually explain whether it's happy to take a cut in something else. Might occasionally say you should put up taxes for the top or something like that. So there is an issue there. Having said all that, the um, you know after the government said they in, in their budget that they borrowed as much as they should, they then found some more because the recent 15 billion package, most of it was in fact borrowing, it wasn't really uh, the windfall tax. Uh, so actually in the end, these, these constraints, which the Treasury will tell you are binding, uh, are not always binding, um, and economically it made sense. So I think that, that's one thing. I think the coalitions, as Sumi said, are really important, and getting even um, you know organisations, charities, who maybe feel a bit more heart with, let's say, analytical people like Resolution Foundation and IFS, sort of all saying the same sort of thing, that is very, powerful um and then of course the other thing is you never quite know what's going to happen i mean, remember in government what well, i can't remember what the issue was but one of the moments when we turned on an issue was when the wi <laughs> turned on us or something people who were not usually radical about these things turned on us. that's important and of course more recently we've had marcus rashford and that was important in universal uh, in, in free school meals and we've had jack munro you know i think a lot of people were always arguing for sort of more indices uh, by sort of income decile of inflation and it never sort of happened and and she's managed to get it to happen so sometimes all the you know as ever with the charity sector how do you get change you have to have some radicals that are out there probably chaining themselves to the doors of downing street some people doing the analysis some people who are campaigning locally and writing to mps you know and then occasional sort of celeb <laughs> that hooks themselves to it in a way that's sort of you know how change often happens and you can't predict what's going to work yeah thanks dan molly is there anything you wanted to add to that yeah no i would just agree with everything that's been said i think um at the resolution foundation we do lots of charts and analysis um but we try and disseminate that to not just government but to the public as well to encourage more discussion and i think in the end it's that sort of discussion and pressure on government that eventually um, feeds through and hopefully um, gets them to, to act. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, moving on for a second to the, the kind of role of independent funders in this, so obviously MPC we do a lot of work with and, and, and for independent funders, philanthropists, because government aren't the only people with the, with the power here, there's other people with funds and ability to uh, invest in um, charities and social services. So uh, someone asked, uh, are we at MPC seeing funders and philanthropists wanting to respond in a similar way to COVID-19? Um, uh, do we think that people will be happier to give unrestricted income? And I think, Dan, we have seen a little bit of um, some similar responses and some lessons carried on from the pandemic, haven't we? But I know that from my own experience, at least, there's definitely been some concerns around the kind of ability to keep doing that and also the ability in the same way that charities have um, to, uh, the concerns around whether or not they're going to be seen as a, a stepping in and, um, and uh, filling a box that the government doesn't need to. Yeah, I think that's right, Theo. I think, uh, so, yeah, a lot of, you know, grant makers, uh, independent grant makers and, um, and philanthropists are thinking it's something they can do. I don't think it's got the same immediacy as COVID in a sort of way. COVID was sort of something that did come from nowhere. I mean, I know it didn't really, but that's how it felt. Whereas to some extent, this cost of living crisis, yes, Ukraine and so forth, but, you know, work by Resolution and others have shown this was all starting to happen before any of that. So in a sense, it was a predictable thing. And some of it was, um, you know, created by decisions of government, not only our government, other governments. And they don't. So it's not got that same sort of we must do something because this has hit us from nowhere. It's shouldn't the guys who knew it was coming have done something earlier. 
I mean, the other thing you're right, Theo, is to some extent, um, you know, some of the grant makers, philanthropists did try and give a lot more than they normally give during COVID. Uh, they also gave unrestricted money, which matters as every charity on this uh, call will know is, is the same kind of gold dust that everybody wants. Um, and, and now I think philanthropists, I mean, it's a difficult thing. I mean, uh, you know, some of them say, if I've got some money, should I just give it to food banks? People are, people are going hungry, you know, school meals and stuff. Is that what I should do? That's the immediate crisis. But some of them have spent quite a long lot of their lives trying to go upstream, a bit like Trussell Trust clearly is, to, to try and stop a lot of these problems happening. And should they stop funding that upstream preventative system change stuff and just fund immediate need or not? And I mean, to be honest, I don't think there's, you know, there's I'm not a, a, an absolute answer that anyone can give to that. But those kind of thoughts wearing away in people's minds. And they also don't know how long this is going to go on, this cost of living crisis. Um, and if you believe the, the bank uh, estimates, then we're not going to get a wage price spiral and everything will be hunky-dory in about a year or something. Um, I'm not sure I believe that. Um, but uh, but if that's what you think, you know, do you, is, is, do you want to sort of drop some, some sort of things that you're funding that are going to take 10 years to deliver, but you think they're really important or something and to try and throw the money at the immediate problem. It's, it's, it's a difficult one that I guess we always get in emergencies. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, uh, Sumi and Molly, I don't know how much you're supported by independent funders or how much contact you have with them, but uh, have you noticed any kind of changes in, in their behaviours or attitudes since the cost of living crisis started? I mean, from the Trussell Trust perspective, not necessarily a shift in behaviours or attitudes, but certainly there is um, still uh, sort of appetite or concern from some um, of our funders. So, for example, corporate partners who stepped in during the pandemic and wants to sort of do something to support um, are similarly concerned about the things that we're seeing. Um, but I think echoing Dan's point around trying to encourage that investment in some of those systemic changes that are needed and, and sort of testing some of those models that would help us move further towards um, longer term change um, is still a sort of tricky one to solve when you're kind of caught between the immediate crisis versus long term change. Yeah, absolutely. Dip, don't um, don't envy people trying to plan out how to use the kind of finite pot of resources at the moment in the past few years. Um, we have a question that's come in about um, the perspective in other devolved nations across the UK. Um, and if the picture that we've kind of laid out today is the same in Scotland, and uh, are there any other kind of um, um, approaches, localised solutions that we should be thinking about to try and uh, support people there. Um, Molly, I don't know if you mind if I come to you first, if you've got anything on that, how the other, how devolved nations are experiencing cost of living crisis differently. Yeah, um, I don't have any data to hand on it. I know um, some of my slides referenced English households, but I think it's fair to assume that um, there'll be people in similar situations in the devolved nations um, and hence they've received um, funding from government um, to deal with that. I think it's fair to assume that areas um, in the devolved nations and also in England that see, uh, well, with lower than average incomes, a higher share of people on lower than average incomes, um, have a higher proportion of people um, claiming different types of benefits. Um, we'll probably uh, see greater uh, demand on their sort of charities. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have any data to hand, but I think it's it's probably to, fair to assume that um, you know, this has been felt, felt everywhere. Yeah, I'm sure, absolutely. Sumi, I don't know if you've got either anecdotally or, or, or any kind of, if you collect data on this, how you've noticed that your food banks across different parts of the UK. Yeah, so the, um, the overall pattern in terms of emergency food parcel provision does um, look a little different across the UK um, and a lot of that reflects um, often the different picture of alternative um, charitable food providers. So in Scotland there's been a real explosion particularly since the pandemic of other alternative um, providers so um, figures in our network will look a bit different to the overall UK picture. Um, that being said, across the UK and um, across the kind of nations and regions, the actual overall um, 
indicators if you look at things like levels of destitution um, or child poverty don't suggest that there are um, areas that are particularly well protected um, or better protected than the overall UK picture and um, we're certainly seeing sort of similar signs around um, escalating need particularly over the last kind of couple of quarters um, right across the UK. I think for one of the additional points for Northern Ireland is that obviously a functioning executive is the critical thing. So um, when we've got uh, support packages that like the one that we've just been announced, the key concern is making sure that that actually um, reaches people who need it in Northern Ireland, given the political situation there. Um, so there are, yeah, there are differing pictures in terms of parcels provided. Overall picture still looks like the level of need is um, uh, you know, high across the UK and has, all parts of the UK has seen that long term increase in food bank need over the years. So that sort of increasing, escalating um, crisis in the long term has been a consistent picture throughout. Yeah, thanks, Simi. Yeah, I'm sure there's been a lot of headaches and frustration at Stormont and around it, people trying to get support at, at the moment. Um, Dan, just to come to you finally, I don't know if there's anything that you'd add to that. No, I mean, not really. I guess, you know, inflation is, is a sort of UK wide phenomenon and it would be slightly surprising if, uh, if it was hitting people completely differently and energy prices going up uh, everywhere. Um, I mean, I mean, one thing, and I'm not sure how it's playing out during the cost of living crisis is I think most of us have a perception that the relationship between the voluntary sector and the sort of government is better in Wales and Scotland than it is in England. There's a more of a partnership some people sometimes feel that particularly in Scotland, the partnership's almost too close and that the sort of sector has slightly lost its independence. But it, on a day to day thing, my, my guess would be that we likely to be far more kind of discussions. And um, just like I, I feel quite strongly that um, we saw during COVID that places like London or the West Midlands or Manchester with a, a mayor, mayoral um, system where the mayor to some extent feels their job is to try and bring all the different groups public private and voluntary together to try and help the area you'll get you'll get more sort of um, ability for everyone to talk about what are the gaps who should what should the charity sector be doing what what it, uh, are there some funding gaps which, which some place-based philanthropists can help with etc etc so my guess is that will be working better in Scotland and Wales um, but I, I, you know I'm guessing to be honest yeah, I suppose kind of, um, as you mentioned earlier, Dan, the kind of the relationship with charities can often be dependent on the, the, the political leaning of the, the party that's in charge at that particular time. So I suppose not wouldn't be totally unsurprising if that would be the case in Wales and Scotland, but upsides as well as downsides um, to that close relationship. Um, we've had a question come in about um, if there's been any kind of shift in how organisations, um, charities, other campaigning groups uh have uh kind of focused their energies in light of the cost of living crisis have we seen or have the panelists noticed any kind of shift towards e economic inequality and maybe away from things like cultural war debates um through recent years and if so uh what impact might this have so i'm just gonna have that open to anyone on the panel who wants to try and take that one well the, the first I, I couldn't compare the silence setting that longer than you. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting with the, the way you phrase that, Theo, that the, the culture wars, which became an, an enormous thing for reasons a bit un, unclear, uh, because I mean, all the polling suggests that most of the British public are not at one end or the other. They're sort of somewhere in the middle ish and don't get too excited about it. And yet it sort of came to dominate and it, it was a tool to sort of attack the charities and and so forth. That, that does seem to have died down away and I mean it's a bit depressing to say you know if you have a sort of uh, a, a sort of terrifying war and a big cost of living crisis then then the, the sort of cultural thing slips away a little bit that would be good news I mean whether charities themselves I think you know obviously some charities are very specialized on a particular thing you know whether that's kind of research into cancer or de dealing uh, you know with with homelessness or whatever and, and they'll have their specific things i mean i know at, at some mungos as an example where i'm on the board you know we are very aware that there will be a lot more uh, people becoming homeless and rough sleeping very soon and we've got to think what to do about that um whether we can you know should we you know at, which every charity we're going through should we throw whatever resource we've got at doing our best over the next year even if that reduces let's say our reserves or something 
um, and put on hold some of the more sort of long term things about getting people who we've managed to get off the streets to take off the uh, stay off the streets for a long time by you know all sorts of support and and so forth um so i think there'll be a lot of charities thinking like that uh, how should they prioritize their resources and are there the group that they work with going to be particularly affected by the cost of living crisis and, and what they can what they can do so i think there'll be a lot of conversations i'm not really aware that people are shifting massively but i suspect there'll be a lot of nuanced shift in a lot of organizations that'd be my guess Thanks, Dan. Uh, Sumi, I think you were about to come in as well on that question. Yeah, just to, um, I mean, I don't think necessarily within the sector um, or within the Trussell Trust, we've had a massive shift. Um, but I think what has been interesting is some of the shift in the political debate and amongst politicians right across the political spectrum, um, particularly sort of since um, really January, February this year onwards, the last few months, and then particularly over the last month or so, hearing people talking about, again, right across the political spectrum about the sort of injustice of people, you know, not being able to put food on the table, making those choices between eating and heating, um, making the kind of the party political case from the Labour point of view, right through to Conservative point of view for doing something differently to tackle those problems. I think that has been um, a bit of a shift. And I think for us in particular, that that's moved away from solely talking about work being the solution. So recognising that there are people who are between jobs who don't necessarily have that financial buffer, people who can't work long hours or who can't work at all, who still need that support and um, should still have access to that basic standard of living at the very least. Um, and, and we kind of saw that in some parts of the Chancellor's statement as well. There's sort of glimmers of hope of perhaps a slight shift in um, some of the discussion and given the kind of political context, not least today, um, it will be interesting to see whether they have to hold on to that in order to navigate their way, to, you know, all, all the political parties navigate their way into the next general election. Um, so the challenge for us as a charity is really to lean into that and to, to try and sustain that concern and that, that strand of political thought um, to try and turn that into action. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks. Thanks for that, Sumi. Um, I'd also be interested in your perspective on this, Molly. Obviously, the Resolution Foundation has kind of looked at economic inequality and living standards for a long time now. But um, I don't know if you've noticed any differences in how people are engaging with your work or the kind of the, the types of platforms you're being invited to, to go on and speak at. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. I think you just like all charities, you have to pivot your resource to where it's most needed and you can't put your head in the sand and ignore what's happening with the cost of living crisis. And uh, while we have a big project looking at the impact of COVID and Brexit, we've put a lot of resource into responding and researching the impact of the cost of living crisis on different households. Um, and I think this has been really effective in terms of um, engagement. Uh, we do a lot of events and get invited um, to speak at a lot of events. So there is um, real interest in, in the analysis that we're producing but I think it does raise questions in terms of that sort of long-term planning because um, it's difficult to jump from one crisis to another to another to another so um, I think it's yeah we've pivoted um, to research the um, what's happening at the minute while also having that sort of long-term view in terms of some of these issues that we've always focused on in terms of improving um, living standards through the labour market and things like that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Molly. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we're coming towards the end of our time, so we've probably got time for one final question. Um, and a question's come in, which I'm just going to kind of uh, ask in an open way to see um, what direction panellists want to take it. So. Um, someone was asking how should charities use their resources so given everything we've talked about today given all the kind of things that charities do in terms of delivering um delivering vital services and trying to influence the government and and, and everything else um if and there's obviously a lot of charities on the call today a lot of people from all over the country doing different things so uh, if the panelists could offer kind of one messages one message to the charities about how they can use their resources to try and tackle the cost of living crisis at the moment what would that message be? Um, it's a bit of an unfair question, so I, I'll come to Dan first. 
quite right. Um, I think it's, you know, it, it depends what sort of charity you are, but basically keep doing what you're doing, have a have a think about how can you twist it a bit to cost of living. But then I would say advocate, 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 whether that's just with the local council to, to make them aware of people that are not getting the help, whether it's the government because you see something that would really help that that group. Because that's that's the big change. Meanwhile, I mean the charities will do do their stuff. That's what charities do, however hard it is. Uh, so in a way, you know, it's teaching them to suck eggs, but uh, but, uh, but feeding all that that information, the local information, the understanding what's happening and pointing out what changes would help uh, must be the right thing to do. Sumi or Molly, is there anything you'd add to that? No, I mean, I think I just, uh, yeah, reiterate the ad advocacy point and particularly that grassroots community level perspective. Um, I think that's uh, a really powerful thing for any elected representative who needs to make the case. Um, to central government in particular. Yeah, I'd say the same. I think sharing those local insights, um, I think they're really valuable. And um, if you can do that wherever possible, I think that will make a really big difference. Great, well, fantastic to end on a note of consensus then. Um, uh, so I suppose that all that's left to say is for me to thank very much all my panelists, Molly, Sumi and Dan for taking the time to speak with us about this today. Um, it's worth saying that we at MPC are going to be continuing doing some work on the, the cost of living crisis. Obviously, there's a lot of implications that this um, that, that we're currently going through that have for charities as well as the people they support. Um, and today we've taken quite a kind of broad, high level perspective um, on some of those issues. But there's a lot of other things that we want to dig into. So we will be um, doing more work here. Um, um, on the questions of uh, funders and independent philanthropists, which came out earlier, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we're working on some some guidance and support for funders on how they can think about directing their uh, resources um, to those in need. So do keep an eye out for those. Um, and we'd also be keen to hear what uh, you think would be helpful for your organisation. So do feel free to get in touch with me or um, with my colleagues at NPC uh, if you've got any thoughts. So um, yeah, just finally, thanks very much to everyone for joining us and we hope you've enjoyed the event today.